I think it's really important so our rangatahi can see themselves reflected back through these gaming worlds. Let's give them the opportunity to see themselves, you know, or their language or their culture come back through these games. But I guess more importantly, it's like if they see um, this content, then it might motivate them to become the future content creators and storytellers within the gaming environment as well. Maru niho niho, thank you very much for joining us on Indigenous 100. Tēnā koe. Tēnā koe. Maru niho niho. What a beautiful name. Where does that name come from? My name actually comes from Te Whanau Apanui, and uh -huh. the full name is Maru Hairimuri. Ah? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Maru Hairimuri niho niho. Where does that name originate from in your whanau? Is it, is, are you the first Maru Hairimuri? No, I'm named after my mother. And she was named after our uh, ancestor, Maru Hairimuri, from Te Whanau, ah, Maru Hairimuri. Ah. Yeah. Talk to me about your mum, because this is, this is Auntie Kui, right? Yes. Okay, tell me about your mum. Well, mum, gee, where do I start? I know that she came down to live in Christchurch a long time ago, and of course that's where she met Dad. Mum also wanted to come down to Christchurch to be with her cousins, who were Uncle Waha and um, Auntie Kiwa. Ah, the Sterling Fano. The Sterling Fano. And um, I think she actually went down for a holiday and ended up staying. <laughs> and uh, she stayed there for, yeah, for the rest of her life. Wow. Um, and we were born and brought up between Christchurch and Tuahiwi. And yeah, it was such a great time to be, I suppose, growing up in a par with my cousins, um, who, yeah, we're still. Hanging out together today. Okay, so so talk to me about Tuahiwi because I've, I've had a bit of experience there and I've been told many times that it is the, the centre of the universe. <laughs> talk yeah. to me about Tuahiwi yeah. Pa. Well, it's a, it's a small place. I mean, people say it's a village. Okay, it is, but it's just about 20 minutes drive from uh, north of Christchurch. Mm. And it's, you know, it's one of those places where if you blink... You'll, you'll miss it. <laughs> but it has a school there. So I went to Tuahiri Primary School there and just across the road and up a little bit is the Marae. Mm. And we used to live further up the road towards the five crossroads on the way to Rangiora. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I just remember, you know, growing up in our whanau home, which we call the White House um, because it's a white house in the middle of paddocks um, and walking there from there to school you know, every day and sometimes through the frost, which is such a good memory because it is very cold down there in winter. And, you know, as children, you don't notice it. You know, it's just a journey on the way to school, um, playing in the ditches and uh, running through the paddocks. Hey, hang on, playing in the ditches? <laughs> What's playing yeah. in the ditches? What do you do playing in the ditches? Well, on the side of the road, they have these big ditches, which are for drainage, I guess, from the paddocks. And um, of course, if there, were water, if there was water in them, they'd freeze over. So we'd jump through all this frost and ice on the way to school and get to school completely frozen cold. <laughs> <laughs> Great way of waking up. What's your fondest memories aside from playing in ditches of growing up at the park? Because, you know, I've, I've talked to a couple of people from Tuahiwi and they talk about it like it's the, it's the most um, amazing experience you could ever have, and better than going to Rainbow's End. Growing yes. up at the park at Tuahiwi, yes. talk to me more yeah. about that. Why is it such an amazing experience for a young Idaho to be growing up at Tuahiwi? Well, it's the open space. You know, really, it's in North Canterbury, so it's flat. Um, there's, there were swamps, you know, right across the road from the uh, marae and next to the school was this massive swamp that we weren't supposed to go to. Ah. Yeah. But of course we went to anyway and, and play with, um, well, the water and the, the frogs and everything else that were, you know, living in the swamp. And, you know, just, I guess, having fun too, like doing other things we weren't supposed to do, like picking up dried up 
cow patties and throwing them at each other, <laughs> um, climbing trees and finding baby birds in their nests and trying not to touch them because we knew that if you touched the birds and the parents won't come back. So yeah. it was really adventurous and um, doing all those cool things like building huts and yeah, playing in the big outdoors. Wow. It was great. Were you a bit of a tutu when you were a kid? Yeah. <laughs> How much of a tutu? Well, because yeah. you can see where I'm yeah. going with this, right, in terms of what your current field of endeavour is. Um, and it appears to me that that's pretty much something that a lot of kids who grew up in the par were like. You know, being a tutu was a good thing. It was part of life. That's right. I mean, we were always told to go outside and play. And so we did. And we quite often had to entertain ourselves. And, you know, by trying to build a little raft that we could you know, paddle in across the swamp um, to climbing trees and trying not to fall out. So we became quite good at working things out. Mm. You know, where could we take our bikes? Or if our bikes were broken, how do we fix them? Um, yeah, so it was quite a really good upbringing out in the park, just to, I guess, have that chance to run around, you know, in the, well, mainly paddocks, but yeah. climb trees and explore and imagine our own games for ourselves. Yeah. Wow. As long as we were home before it got dark. Okay. That was the main thing. And, and when you, were you encouraged particularly to do this by the likes of your mum and your dad and aunties and uncles? That was yeah. a thing, right? Was encouraging, I guess, you know, creativity. Yeah. Well, new exercise, new stuff. Because we'd all like be outside playing and the cousins next door would be out playing and then we'd be like, oh, let's go over to the swamp, you know, and entertain each other. And... Um, so it was just a, you know, it was just a thing in those days. Go mm. outside and play. And if we're at the marae, we'll go in the kitchen and dry the dishes. And then you can go outside and play or help clean up, you know. So we'd hurry up and do all our jobs so we could get out wow. and run around and try not to get told off because we were running on the fence outside the front. Um, or, you know, it was just a, a really great experience for us to be growing up in that environment. Mm. So your mum... Same name, Maru yeah. Hane Muri. Um, a bit of an, a doyen in terms of te reo within, within Ngaito. Um, she's still referred to as Auntie Kui and her efforts with real revitalisation in Ngaito by the likes of Dr. Hana O'Regan and Charisma. They talk, to, talk about her a lot. Were there any expectations on you carrying your mum's name in terms of future leadership? Well, now this gets a little bit complicated because I grew up, you know, as I was just saying, between um, Tuahiwi and Christchurch. Now, quite often would go back into the city. And of course, being out in Tuahiwi and going to Tuahiwi school, there were, you know, all the kids looked like me. We all had Māori names. We were learning te reo. We were doing kapahaka across the road at the marae. But as soon as I went back into Christchurch, that was the end of that. You know, I was at um, Sydenham School on Colombo Street. I was the old one out. You know, I didn't fit in. Nobody looked like me. Nobody could say my name. Uh, Mum used to tell me, your name is not Maru. He says, your name is Maru Haidemuri. You tell them how to say your name. And I used to say to her, but they can barely say Maru. And I, I got given names like Mary. I would just call you Mary or Marie or whatever else. And so I said to mum, but no one can say my name. And she said, well, you teach them. And so I remember growing up at a young age, you know, saying to mum, why did you call me such a long name for? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and being a little bit upset about it because it was, you know, uh -huh. it was, oh, well, I got teased at school, you know, from having a funny name to why are you brown? Mm. You know, and questions like that. And I was like, I hate it here. I want to go back to Tohiwi. And um, also at that time, you know, I think mum was trying to um, teach my sisters and I, you know, to deal because she was a native speaker. Mm. But it was all this kind of growing up, you know, not in a Māori environment. Um, so I think mum did try but we just weren't picking it up. Mm. And unfortunately, you know, because right now I wish I could speak to Neil Māori fluently, even though I grew up around uh, tikanga and I grew up around um, kapahaka and the reo and everything, I still can't speak it. 
And yeah, so when I do think back, it's like, shame. <laughs> Here I am, daughter of um, someone who was fluent, you know, and a native speaker as well. And unfortunately, yeah, I can't speak the language myself. And another, you know, other thoughts, especially uh, what my aunties tell me is that, well, your mother was of the generation of you don't need to teach your kids to speak that language. It's going to be no good for them. And yeah, so even though I wasn't brought up um, speaking it later in life, mum was very sure about me learning. And of course, by that stage, I had no interest. Mm. You know, it wasn't until I had my uh, first child where she said, put your baby in kohanga. And I said, why? You know, and then, you know, having real moments of realisation about how I wish I could speak it myself. So from that point, when I um, put my son into kohanga and I became more involved with kohanga, then I started to pick it pick the language back up again, slowly wow. but surely. So there was this big gap between Tuahiwi Primary School and um, yeah, my first child going to Kohanga before I picked up the language again. What, what was the main reason why you weren't interested? Oh, I think it was, you know, once, because there's only a primary school out in Tuahiwi and for intermediate you have to go to Kaiapui yeah. or, yeah. or Woody in the one's town. And because there was no real at all um, at Sydenham or Christchurch, uh, South Intermediate or Kashmir, um, then there was sort of no, well, how am I going to learn anyway, even if I wanted to, even though mum was right there. Um, so I think I just lost interest due to a bit of, you know, being bullied and teased, um, not just for my name, but for what I am. Hmm. Um, and I felt that so strongly. I was always so self-conscious about being Māori, you know, growing up in Christchurch, um, in those days anyway. Mm. And I think that probably had some bearing into why I never went ahead at a younger age and learnt to learn Māori or asked mum to teach me. I think mum had tried, okay. but had sort of given up, you know. What would people say you were like at school? Oh, probably quiet, yeah. It was really quiet um, in primary, especially so. I didn't, well, especially at, in Christchurch, I didn't really talk to my classmates. I just felt so different. I just felt so out of place after going, to, you know, from Tuahiwi, where we're all doing everything together to being and feeling quite isolated um, at uh, Sydenham Primary. And so I was, you know, very quiet. Um, I listened, you know, which because I was able to amazingly when I got into high school um, pass a few subjects in school certificate. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it was quite, except for when I got into high school. Then I, uh, so there's a little bit of a story. Okay, there. here we go. <laughs> uh, I've, I've strapped myself in. I'm keen on this. Here we go. So I was living in Christchurch, um, spent a year at Kashmir High School. Yep. Um, good um, school, good school. It was a good school. I uh, made a few good friends and I'm still with, yeah. uh, friends with today. Um, but then mum uh, got a job transfer with uh, Māori Affairs at that time and we moved to Wellington. So I went from primary school being mainly Māori to another primary school, intermediate and high school, which was mainly Pākehā, to my next high school, which was mainly Māori again. And um, which was Taita College ah. in, in Lower Hutt. So yeah. that was awesome. I was like, oh, everyone looks like me again. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, by that stage, though, I'd become quite uh, uninterested in school. You know, and why was that? I just think it was probably the effects of changing, you know, the ah. change that I had from primary and then going into... Um, a school where I just felt isolated and that feeling always stuck with me. Right. Just sort of, I'm out of place here um, until I got back, uh, got to Tider College. And then I was like, whoa, I'm, I'm kind of around. Back people. with my peeps. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Back here and I just was like really comfortable. I felt comfortable, probably a bit too comfortable um, because 
I started to, well, I wasn't like rebelling or anything at school, but by then my interest in education was like way down. Um, and the things that I wanted to do um, clashed with other things uh, in terms of subjects at school. So I really wanted to do um, technical drawing and art, but they clashed with other subjects that I was also interested in. Um, and so I spent quite a bit of my high school years um, playing spaces. Yeah. Where did the playing spaces thing come from? Um, well, that started when I was an intermediate, actually, yeah. in Christchurch. Um, and I knew I was an intermediate because I was in my uh, uniform. But, you know, it would be like, usually Friday nights, and mum would say, come home from work and say, I'm going to take away tonight. And, yeah, that will be nice. So what do you want? And, of course, I'd be like, fish and chips, because I knew I would have change so I could play the spaces. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd be like, oh, can't play back. Go and get you some fish and chips. And like one hour later, or whenever it was, once my change had, you know, finished by playing spaces, I'd come home. And she'd be like, well, your fizz and chips must be pretty cold <laughs> by now. <laughs> and they were. But um, she knew. Yeah. She knew I was playing the games. And I think that's why she gave me a little bit extra. So I would have change to put in the, the right. machines. Yeah. This is interesting for me, right? Because we're a similar age. Uh, it'll be hard to believe for the audience because of the fact that I look like I'm 60 and you're, you look like you're 23. But um, there are kids who pick up spaces like that and, and they used to, I'll be honest, they used to really tick me off. Because <laughs> um, I was rubbish at it. Because I was such an athlete. No, um, but I, I was rubbish at it, right? I, I, I couldn't, well, I just wasn't any good. Were you one of those kids that just was good at it straight away? Yeah. I think I was. How? Yeah. Why do you think you were able to just bang it away? And I think it comes back to having that kind of tutu inquisitive mind, you know. Because um, before that, I used to make stuff. Like? Um, well, my mum would always encourage me. She'd be like, you know, if there was a birthday party or something coming up, and I'd say, can I buy a present for my friend? She'd tell me to make it. <laughs> Yeah, she'd be like, you can make it. It'll be original and unique and made by you. And I'd just be like, oh, how embarrassing. <laughs> I'd be the only one turning up with a homemade car <laughs> with glitter all over it and stuff. And I was like, oh, shame, you know. Um, but she'd, you know, here's the glitter and here's the crayons yeah. and here's some paper from work, you know, and make your friend a present. And I'd be like, oh, my gosh. So I got quite used to um, making stuff. Because okay. I don't really have a choice, you know. I'd go to this birthday party with nothing. <laughs> so I had to make something. Um, and I think, you know, um, and my dad as well, he was encouraged creativity with me. He'd be like, bought me a tricycle once and we painted it together. And, you know, it was just, you know, I think they saw that I had this kind of... Bent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was like, okay, she she likes making stuff, so let's encourage it. And, um, wow. yeah, so I think... Kind of that combined, you know, with having just an inquisitive mind as well. Yeah. Always asking questions, even though I was quiet at school. You know, I'd ask a lot of questions and try and figure out stuff by myself. So I guess, you know, looking at the arcade machine for the first time, I was like, hmm, how does this work? You know, figured it out, how to play pretty much straight away. Oh, mind you, I used to really enjoy watching others play. So I'd be standing there watching and going, oh, okay, so that's how they, you know, get the high scores or yeah. whatever. And then I'd just go and do it. But I remember just being really curious while I was playing these games, thinking, how did they make them? And I always wondered, how did they make these games? Like, how do you control the character on the screen to move? You know, what does that take? And that stuck with me. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. What was the first game you ever played? It was Space Invaders, uh -huh. or it could have been Galaga. Oh, yeah. It was one of those two, it was some flying spaceship yeah. game. And I remember after figuring out how to play the game, it was like, now how do I keep my high score up? Because you put your initials in as a high score. And I remember going back the next week and seeing that my initials were bumped down the leaderboard and thinking, oh, someone's beating my high score. 
one and now I'll go and try and beat their high score. So then I became competitive with somebody I didn't even know, you know. Um, so yeah, it turned from curiosity and the sort of trying to work out how you play to now I want to be the best. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And was that behind your kind of thinking around wanting to look at doing uh, tech drawing and those kind of subjects in school was aligned to kind of that, given that interest? No, I think because I didn't even know what it took to make a game. But it's funny now when I think back to the subjects that I was good at at school and the ones that I wanted to do relate exactly to what I do today. Yeah. So technical drawing science, um, which I really enjoyed, um, especially the practical hands-on stuff. And we'd get an assignment to go and collect garden bugs and we had to freeze them and then pin them to a board and write about them. Well, that was me. I was like out in the garden pulling all sorts of bugs out and felt a bit sorry for them when I was freezing <laughs> them. <laughs> but it was that kind of thing I really liked. Yeah. And, um, and of course, art and computer studies, which was on some dinosaur looking computer. I don't <laughs> even know what it was, but I did enjoy that. Yeah. So it's like, if only um, while I was at school or high school that, that I suppose kids like me who um, wanted to learn something different or do something different were noticed and then encouraged to sort of be like, well, maybe you should, you know, learn more about computer studies or, or, or get into this subject a bit more. I think it was just a pathway to be presented where it was, well, you know, you, after school you go to university and what do you do at university? Oh, well, you can study to become a whatever, you know, and it wasn't something that appealed to me to mm. go to university and study something that I didn't even know I wanted to study. But... Yeah, I guess it would be hard though. You know, you see kids that are kind of really inquisitive and like making and breaking stuff to sort of guide them into where their potential career path could be. Yeah. Yeah, so. How many, tell me, when, when, you, when you were looking seriously at this, hmm. how many Māori kids doing computer studies? How many young Māori female kids doing computer studies? Yeah, not many. <laughs> and was, did you ever think, wow, I'm kind of the only one around here? When I first started um, my company, uh, it was, oh, well, I had a few surprises actually. For one, I didn't realise that there were no, you know, sort of women in gaming, you know, well, especially in New Zealand anyway. And then when I found out I'm the only Māori woman in gaming, I was like, how come? Yeah. You know, it, I just sort of assumed that it was a thing. Why? Um, Why that assumption? Um, well, because I grew up around girl cousins <laughs> and <laughs> they were just like me. <laughs> they were just the same as me. We were girls and we were playing spaces and, yeah. and then when we could afford it, you know, when I managed to buy a Sega Mega Drive. Um, then oh, we were, Flash guy. Oh, ooh, Flash, I was. <laughs> 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 then we were all playing that, so I just saw others just like me yeah. who were playing arcade games or computer games that happened to be girls as well. So when I was in, when I got into the industry and I heard, well, girls don't make games and girls don't play games, I was like, hey, yeah. I grew up with girls that played games and my cousins, you know, we and my schoolmates, we were playing games. Where does that, how did you figure that one out? So those sort of comments didn't compute with me, yeah. they were just like, okay. So I didn't let it bother me um, and just carried on doing what I was doing. But I was just surprised that there weren't more women in the industry. Yeah, I was like, ooh, that was a surprise. Mm. Okay, so you, you go to start this company. Mm. What are you telling the likes of your mum, <laughs> your cousins, yeah. um, you know, Fano friends? What are you telling them you're doing when you're going to start this company? What are you saying to them? Well, when I said it, when I announced it, when I said I'm going to start a games company, my immediate fan I weren't surprised because they see me in my binge weekends with my PlayStation and you know, and, and half of those binge weekends were with my nieces or, or cousins and that. So they were like, oh yeah, they were just wondering how I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, but a lot of other people were really surprised. Okay, they were just like, 
gaming. Where did that come from? You'll um, never make money off that. Yeah. <laughs> That's for kids, you know, that, and you know, teenage boys in dark rooms that play PlayStation all night. And I'm like, well, I'm not a teenage boy. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I just thought, well, what a challenge. And it, well, it surely was. Yeah. Like, because I had all the passion for wanting to do it. You know, I had this idea that, um, or self belief that I could do it. And I didn't sort of let anything um, phase me. You know, even though I was sort of hearing that it was going to be really hard and you don't actually know how to make games true and true but i was willing to give it a go you know um i was willing to sort of say well i said to myself well it won't happen if i don't try so so hang on just just so i'm clear you tell people you're going to start a gaming company Hmm. you don't know how to make the games Hmm. no one like you in the industry doing it um and Really, your experience is based on being a bit of a tattoo playing games. Mm-hmm. You can kind of see how some people go, wow, that's... I know. Brave. I see that now. Didn't see that <laughs> at the time. <laughs> so what was, yeah. what was the driving kind of... What was the thing that said, I can do this? Mm. Where, describe that for me. Where did that come from? Ooh, that's a little bit hard to describe. I think I just had this idea in my head that I'm going to do this and I'm and the only way to do it is to actually take that step forward. Give it a go. Yeah, and give it a go. And I knew it was going to be hard because I knew I didn't have that experience behind me in terms of designing or developing games. I knew I'd have to learn that really, really fast. And so I knew there would be a steep learning curve there. But knowing all that, I still, when I said, oh, I can do it, and I, I had that much self-belief. Okay. Yeah. Where does that come from? The, self- the self-belief thing. The fact that, okay, yeah. so I haven't got any experience this, but I know I can do it. Mm. What What is driving that? Where does that come from? What's the source for that? Wow. It was probably a big mixture of things. You know, growing up from a child to where I got to in that point to make that decision. Um, and, and probably a lot of different experiences. Like, for example, when I left school, um, uh, my job, my first job was working in an op shop and, um, and I wasn't paid either. Because mum said to me, look, if you want to leave school, you're going to have to go and get a job. And I said, yep, I will then. I'll go and get a job. <laughs> stubborn. I might be stubborn. <laughs> um, and I found one at the tighter shops at the... Um, Salvation Army op shop. I know the, the Salvation Army on Tider on Tider Drive on the uh, main road at Tider. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, and anyway, next door to that op shop was Beanies, which is the takeaway. Yeah, you know, yeah, where the yeah. Spaces were. So of course I was playing Spaces, and I went over to the op <laughs> shop. I said, "Do you have a job?" And they were like, "We're always looking for volunteers, dear." And I was like, okay. <laughs> so um, they gave me a job, and they said, "Well, you won't get paid, but you can help yourself to." you know, some clothes or whatever. And I said, oh, okay, well, at least I'll get some experience and stuff. Um, And then I said to mum, I got a job. And she said, oh, that's good, babe. And, you know, how much are you getting paid? Nothing. (laughs) But I'm getting experience. And I think she sort of was like, oh, well, at least she's doing something. So um, my, I guess my career path wasn't that I was set on a life in retail and hospitality. Mm. It was I didn't have anything else that I could do mm. at that time. And I think working in – so after the, the op shop, I worked in a restaurant, and that was 14 years in hospitality after that. And I realised during those 14 years that this is not what I want to do. Um, it was – a good living, mm. you know, I got some great experience from the industry and ended up owning a place myself, which was wonderful. But I knew, always knew in the back of my head that that was not what I wanted to do. And also knowing that I wasn't quite sure what it is I want to do. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think it was a mix of all of that before. And then this little hobby I had of playing computer games. Mm. So I just sort of thought, well, 
I've got some management experience and I've been in management and hospitality for a few years now. So I got that bit. Yeah. Um, I know how to run a business. Yeah. Got that bit. Uh, I just don't know how to make games. I'll learn that bit and I'll learn it real yeah, fast. A little bit of a gap there. <laughs> just, yeah, just something small. Yeah, yeah. And so I think, yeah, it's a combination of not, of wanting change, of not wanting to do something that I really don't want to do. Um, and moving into an industry or a world where I know that I would be happier. So that was motivation, you know, to, if I really want to do that, then you're gonna have to get up and walk that path. Okay. Yeah. What, what was the outcome you were looking for though when you started in this business? Because you've been in it for a long time now, right? Yeah. And I'm curious to know what the outcome yeah. was when you started Hmm. and whether it's still the same or things might have changed a little bit? Yeah, no, things changed for right. sure. Um, so what we originally, what was the outcome you were looking for when you originally, was it just to make money or? Yeah, well it was, uh, I'd say coming at, at it from a creative point of view, I just wanted to be creative and do cool stuff and make cool games and hopefully make money too, Yeah, you know. Um, but, and that's how it started. So I did, oh, it was hard though. I did spend a couple of years learning, going to conferences, going to you know places like E3 and yeah. um, the Game Developers Conference in, in the States and learning, sitting there and listening and asking lots of questions. Um, and then I ended up building a prototype for my first game. It wasn't the one I was pitching though. The one I was pitching was um, a Māori themed game. It was all about this guardian and, and everything else. And I spent a good chunk of a year pitching the idea. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even have a prototype for it. And there was lots of interest, but I think publishers were looking at me like, well, you haven't made a game before, so why should we give you X amount of dollars? Um, you're a bit risky in that. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, they don't like my game, you know, yeah. or they don't like my idea, but really it was, you know, risk management on their part. Like, why should we give you this much money? So knowing or realizing that while I was overseas, I had to um, come up with a different strategy. And so that was the, I guess, the birth of this new idea, um, which ended up being my first published uh, game on the PlayStation internationally. Yeah. So there were lots of learning curves in what I was doing. Um, I had to overcome being a bit shy as well. I mean, because when you go to these conferences, the people that you want to talk to are swamped by lots of other people that are there for the same reason you are, you know, trying to sell their next idea. And quite often I would see these people being crowded and I used to think to myself, how am I going to get to that person? And, you know, being really shy about it and I'd just sort of stand there and watch and then realising that I'm not getting anywhere. Hurry up, Madhu, go over and say hello. <laughs> go introduce yourself. You know, psyching myself up into this meeting that I needed to have. Um, so, yeah, there were a lot of different learning curves. Well, mm. so, so this is really important because we're going to have a lot of people who are listening or watching who like you at that stage in your life and it's a very inherently Māori thing. We, we mm. are quite whakamā. It's not our thing. Mm. Generally speaking, we're not like that. We don't yeah. like going up and forcing ourselves and foisting ourselves upon, upon people, right? Yeah. So what advice can you give to people who potentially mm. now are starting mm. their own companies now and finding it really hard to do that initial pitch process mm. and break down that tanifa, yeah. whakamā? <laughs> well... What, how I did it for myself was, I just keep saying to myself, if I don't do it, I'm not going to get anywhere. It's not going to happen. And it took a while, you know, I think it was by the second conference I got to where I felt brave enough to even sort of start walking towards, you know, the person who I wanted to, to speak to. And so, yeah, so it was a lot of, um, come on, Maru, if you don't do this, and I'm going to get anywhere, psyching myself into it and understanding that the goal is to get a game out there and get it published. Uh, if I just stand in the corner, you know, pretending that I'm doing something when I could be talking to someone about 
the idea that I have and potentially them backing me, then nothing was going to happen. And of course, I talked to my whanau about this as well. How do I approach people? Mm. They're like, you just got to do it. You know, be brave, kia kaha, be like your ancestors. <laughs> you know, you're going to war. And, uh, and all this. <laughs> war. Get out there. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay then. And, you know, so it's a lot of um, support, you know, a lot of kōrero support to, to try and get to that point where you feel confident enough to go and talk to somebody. And the other thing that I realised, which I picked up on, was because um, I don't have an American accent and that, when I did get to these people, that would be the first thing they noticed. And they'd say to me, where are you from? And that was a conversation starter. Right. So once I figured that bit out, like, oh, these people are all interested in where I'm from because my accent is quite different to everyone else's, then I knew that was my like hook. Mm. You know, I just still had to go up to these people. But once I was there and introduced myself, knowing that they were just as interested to talk to me as I was to them, because they're very curious as to where are you from? And oh New Zealand, oh yes, that movie. And hoping that say the nice movie. <laughs> that movie. <laughs> Uh, whale rider oh, yes yeah. yes yeah. sometimes it was the other one the one with the tattoos all over yeah. oh yes that one too but no matter what it was a good um conversation starter and eventually i'd get to oh i've got this idea you know for a game and then would go into that conversation right so yeah it was just a matter of um really overcoming a personal hurdle of being very shy you know, and your heartbeat is going out, of, you know, you're just going to like try and hold it in place because you're so nervous. Um, yeah, but once you sort of get past that first barrier, okay. it does become easy. So, so how long did it take? Because uh, there will be people who, like me, hate rejection, mm. right? Yeah. Particularly if you're whakama. Mm. Uh, you know, you, you pluck up the courage to go up to someone yeah. and pitch something you've been working on for a long, long time and you hit a little alone getting out on, on, on a bit of paper mm. uh, or on the computer as it is. Um, mm. And all of a sudden you've got the courage and you go up and it's like, sorry, I'm not interested. And that yeah. really can be quite debilitating. And I suspect you probably had a few of those as well. Mm. Yes. How did you deal with that? What kept the drive going to yeah. keep pitching, keep breaking down the fucker mark? Yeah, I had lots of those. How did lots. you deal with it? Oh, well, I remember at the time feeling that twang, you know, oh, oh. they hate my idea and, well, you know, they probably didn't hate the idea. They probably just, I didn't explain it properly or um, or maybe they just weren't interested for other reasons. But it was, yeah, it was pretty shocking. Uh, I remember the first time when having a chat to a publisher and he's like, well, hmm, no, it's really not something I'm interested in. After we had been talking for like 10 minutes and I was like, oh, why didn't you say that in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> right in the first minute instead of waiting until the end of the conversation. So I felt like more annoyed then, you know, but after that, letting that sink in, it was like, oh, no, you know, rejected. Um, but I used that, you know, feeling as motivation. <laughs> I sort of turned it around. I said, all oh, right, well, somebody here is going to want to, you know, believe in what I'm doing and, and and the idea that I have. But then I keep having them, mm. you know. Sometimes it wasn't directly to my face. Sometimes it was by email or, um, oh, nice to meet you, but sorry, you know, we're not interested. Um, or even worse, it was someone who said, we love this and I'll get on to this email and I'll send it through and you'll hear from me in a week. and. Then you do hear from them, but it's the, you yeah, know, sorry, you know, right. kind of thing. And there were moments where it's like, what am I doing? You know, no one is going to back me with my ideas or whatever. What am I doing wrong? A lot of self-doubt, a lot of questioning, um, a lot of maybe I should just pack my bag and go home, you know, and, and give up. And, you know, there were moments of tears. You know, what am I doing over in San Francisco um, at this conference and I can't even get a meeting, you know, with people who said that, we'll meet you there. 
And yeah, so a lot of, um, yeah, you have to be pretty resilient. So, so what kept you going? What kept you, yeah. what stopped you mm. from packing the bag, getting the ticket home? Because I believed I could do it. You know, I really believed I could do it. I had a lot of self-belief and even though it was hard and I had a lot of rejection, I still had this thing of, I can do this. I was just looking for a chance for someone to back me because I wanted to prove myself because I felt that I'd come so far and announced to the world that I'm going to make games and all that and the whanos that supporting me that I now I really had to do it. You know, it was just this thing that I felt I wasn't going to stop until I had, you know, given it my best, best shot. And yes, there were moments where it was like, oh, stuff this, this is all too hard. I'm going to give up. But then I'd come back and I'd be like, no, <laughs> I'm not giving up. I haven't done what I was supposed to do yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was quite, I guess the rejections in a way made me stronger yeah. as well. That was sort of like, well, okay, if you don't think, you know, this is worthy or you don't believe in me, well, I'll show you that I can. You know, it was almost like, well, I'll, I'm going to do it anyway. And um, I think it's stubborn. Yeah. I think okay. It's just being a, a little bit stubborn. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about then the when the agreement does come, when the support does come. And because I remember that, and it's a few years gone by now, but it, you still must remember that well. Mm. Uh, yeah. Because I remember when you announced, and I remember thinking, who is this lady? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, um, and thinking, wow, this is completely different. I mean, I, you know, I remember thinking, man, if I had kids, I can't wait to have kids so I can get them playing my games <laughs> from, yeah. a, from someone who's created games, Māori games, and gamification for our own. Right, and um, I can only imagine what that must have been like for you after all the rejections and stuff, going through that point and then thinking, mm. wow, I've, I'm mm. there. Yeah. Did you celebrate it or did you go straight away going, right, next one up? Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, I was like, next. Mm. I celebrated a little bit. I was like, oh, it was more of a huge, massive sigh of relief yeah. when I got the first contract. And that, which contract again was that? That was um, that was for um, the Cube game, Cube game yeah. which was released on PlayStation. Yeah. That was, a, yeah, just a massive sigh of relief because by that stage I had maxed out on my credit cards. <laughs> all my savings was gone. It was almost not in mum's credit cards. Yeah, it was, it was like, whoa, there's nothing left. There was actually nothing left. Um, when I signed that contract, um, I come back from San Francisco. Um, I was feeling down because no one had any interest. Come back and I, I said to my father, I think I might give up because wow. nothing happened in San Fran and, and I'm just about to finish the last of the budget for what's left. And it's been a couple of years now. And they were like, no, 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 you've come so far, you know, don't give up. It's not like you to think about giving mm. up. And I said, well, I don't know what else to do. And then an opportunity came up to go to Melbourne for the games conference over there. And at that time, I think it was Industry New Zealand um, was going to support the developers from New Zealand to go over. And so that was 50% reimbursement along those lines. And I thought, oh... I can do I'll this one. I'll give it one, one more yeah. shot. Yeah. I'll give okay. it one more go because I've got some money there that will cover this. And so while in Melbourne, three days, um, I had a booth there set up with my prototype by that stage of our cube game. And publishers were passing and playing and saying, oh, that's a neat game. And yeah, people will get in touch, you know. And I'd, of course, stand there like, yeah, 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 I heard that before. You know, I was really in that mode by then. I was like, I've heard this all before, we'll be in touch. And so on the last day, the last publisher came through and stopped and played and said, well, I think this would work really well. Um, here's my card and he took mine and we'll be in touch. And of course, I was like, oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> what, whatever, babe. Yeah, I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Heard that for, all, for the last three days and for the last two years and all that. 
So we packed up and I came back home mm. to New Zealand. I thought, oh, well, I gave it yep. another shot. And then I had the email come through from the publisher. And basically what he said was, how much money do you need? And I was like, can somebody check, double check this email <laughs> for me? Because I think I might be seeing things now. Um, and it was like, no, he's offering you a contract. And so I forwarded that email to my lawyer and he said, okay, well, do your budgets and right. let him know. And then it went from there. Um, my first game was published. It took a year to make. And whoa, that was intense yeah. <laughs> because we weren't just making it for ourselves we we're making it for a publisher we were making it for sony as well so you had to go through their qa processes yeah. and you have to be approved by sony to be a developer well i managed to do all that before and i i, I knew what i had to do to please a publisher which was get sony approved and all that that was already done um however when you're in development mode ooh, yeah they're mm -hmm. really tough mm -hmm. publishers tough I mean, it's their money. And I was totally motivated to make this game work um, because it was somebody who had shown that they believed in me and my idea. And so we developed it on budget, on time. It was published worldwide. And I sat back and I was like, see, I told you I can make a game. <laughs> it was like, it was that break I needed, you know, right. after all that time. And it sounds really funny, I know. It sounds strange to have so much self-belief in yourself that you can do something that you've never done before. But yeah, I just knew I could. I, yeah. Yeah, I just knew that it seemed to be my path. Um, yeah, but then a couple of years later, I actually figured out what was my actual path okay, within gaming. Yeah. So what, what, what is the actual path? Because I, yeah. I remember when you launched your first Maori Maori game, and I yeah. was in the media at the time, and I thought this is, like, this is the world has changed. <laughs> That's what I thought at the time, and I remember talking yeah. to my mates in the media at the time, and I thought, and we all felt the same. We thought, yeah, the, the world's changed. Mm. You know, w was that the path? Yeah. Well, so I'll go back a little bit. Oh, okay. oh my gosh, I've got so much to tell. <laughs> But um, straight after we finished developing the Cube game, um, I was on a radio in interview with BFM at Auckland Uni, right. talking about Cube. Um, they'd got me in to sort of, you know, do a pitch on what the Cube game was and how it can be purchased and all that. At the same time, uh, a group from Auckland University uh, was listening to that interview and they were thinking about making a game um, to help rangatahi Māori who suffer from mild depression. Mm -hmm. um, and a few days before they heard my interview, they were um, trying to find an Auckland-based game developer um, and they thought it would be really awesome if they could find a, a Māori company, you know. And then they thought it would be really, really cool if they could find a Māori woman, mm. um, Auckland-based game developer. And they just happened to hear me speaking on the radio at that time. Um, and they contacted me straight away and said, we're thinking about doing this game, would like to work with you. And so that was the next game I worked on, which was completely different from what I had or what I was thinking in terms of making commercial titles for entertainment um, to make a profit, you know, basically sell them. Uh, whereas this game, which is now called Sparks, um, was to help our young people um, by giving them an interactive tool set mm. based on cognitive behavioural therapy uh, through gaming. And so at first I was like, whoa, I've never made a game like that before. Actually, I've only made one game before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I'm willing to work with you and we can work together and bring this game to life. And that's what we did. So I didn't have any sort of psychiatry background mm. or I barely even knew what cognitive behavioural therapy was. I had to read about it and, and learn about it and so I could apply that to the gaming environment. And um, yeah, so we made a good team. So we were game developers and, and clinicians and psychologists working together on bringing this game to life. Well, it was during that development where I guess I thought about why I enjoyed playing games. You know, what was it about it? 
Um, it was the story or it was your mission. It was about completing something mm. within that environment. It was about doing it in your own time, self-paced. Um, you're not assessed. Um, you're only assessed by how much you complete within the game itself. And so that all lends itself really, really well to educational uh, type games. And so, yeah, it was while I was developing the Sparks game that I thought, hang on, games are more than just for entertainment. You know, what about if I start looking at games from a different point of view and try to bring through educational elements or learning outcomes um, through the gaming environment for kids to learn while they're playing, you know? In fact, it's probably a, a way of learning that I would have loved um, as a young person. And yeah, that's where my path started to take a, a change. So still doing games, still making and designing them, um, but this time with an educational or learning outcome. And one of those is te reo Māori. I think this is a great way for me to learn <laughs> uh, because I get to, you know, look at these translations, especially in one of our latest games, which is all about teaching our rangatahi to understand what is code, mm. you know, and what are code, coding concepts and how do you use it. And so there's all these new technical terms in te reo in this game. So I'm learning all these really neat technical terms and I can't even speak Māori yet. <laughs> but if you ask me, you know, a technical term, then I'll probably be able to tell you. So now I've just got to fill in my own gaps within with what I'm doing and um, you're on your own learning journey now. There we go. Yeah. I'm on it. Just I'm, as your yeah. consumers are on their own journey exactly. with your yeah. with your games. So it's sort of like taking what could what could have worked for me when I was younger or yeah. could can work for me now and incorporating those things into the gaming environment. And um, you know, I think it's really important so our rangatahi can see themselves reflected back through these gaming worlds and because they love playing games you know they love Fortnite and and Roblox and all these other games then let's give them the opportunity to see themselves you know or their language or their culture come back through these games but I guess more importantly it's like if they see um, this content then it might motivate them to become the future content creators and storytellers within the gaming environment as well. Okay. Yeah. How do you protect intellectual property? Mm. How do you protect your ideas? How do you do that plus make goods for consumers, games for consumers that are educational, all those kind of things, retain mm. tikanga Māori or have uh, Māori imagery, Māori underpinned by Māori philosophy and, value, philosophy and values, but also protect intellectual property. How do you work all that together? Because it is yeah. complex, mm. and you've also got to try and, to a certain degree, monetize it so you can get a return on it as well. Yeah. How, how do you do all that? Oh, that is very tricky. <laughs> it is, but it's an awesome learning curve, again, for me. Mm. Um, because it does, you know, one of my games, which is called Guardian Maya, which is a fictional yeah. story, and it's all fictional, it's all made up, it's really different, but it incorporates a lot of Māori themes from karakia to mana, you know, what is mana? How do I display that in a gaming environment? That was one of my big questions. And this is where mum, because I started working on this idea 16 years ago, right. yeah. was my very first game pitch back then was Guardian Maya. Um, and I used to ask mum, you know, is it all right to show mana in the game as prestige rather than power? And she'll be like, well, that's what it is, babe. It's all, <laughs> that's what your mana is. It's how people perceive you and what you do that builds your mana. Okay then, so in my game, we're not going to have power. In terms of the character's strength, it'll be her mana and her actions determine how her mana is or how high or low her mana goes. So the character in the game can either do really good stuff, you know, it can, the character can save another character or it can kill another character, but that has a consequence 
you know, and so that consequence can um, have you being highly esteemed and respected, or if you're really low on your mana, then you are disrespected by others in the game because they're like, Poo, who are you? You know, or you, you know, you, you kind of made the wrong decision or wrong choice. So it was really tricky to build a mana system, as we call it in the structure of the game, mm -hmm. because that also was built upon a choice and consequence system. And those uh, consequences, of course, depend on, um, or sorry, will grow your mana in terms of the person that you are. And it's really hard to talk about it because really those things come down to the player. So we just set up a system in place. It's up to the player what they decide to do with it. And so while the game doesn't teach you what is mana, you will just learn it through doing. Mm. You know, it's just learning through your actions by controlling the character in the game. Um, you will learn that through being able to see uh, your statistics. So basically, well, my... Um, health bar is good but my mana bar is really low why is that you know I've gone and made a decision somewhere down the track that isn't quite right so it's sort of taking I guess those um, elements or themes around Māori te ao Māori you yeah. know and doing as best as I can to present them in in a very good way or it, in the way that they're supposed to be, which is extremely tricky with game development because you've got, because it's interactive, you know, so there's always got to be a choice. There always has to be a choice for the player, you know, who's playing the game. And although you can direct all those choices to be good, well then it's not really a game because yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're just following a path in that case. So the interactivity puts an extra layer or level of thought, you know, on it. Whereas if you're just telling a straight story, you can guide that story right to the end along the path that you wish that story to go. It has and a logical helps. sequence and flow. Yeah. And, yeah. But with gaming, it's not like that. It's yeah. interactive and, and the player often makes the choice. So we give them the choice in the game. Well, you can finish this episode um, with a high mana status or not. But if you do, then this is what you get, um, which is a beautiful cloak, um, which is magical, or you get the something else. I'll, yeah. I won't give away the story too much. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. no, because I, I remember when you launched it, and I think your mum was, was still alive. Well, mum... Yeah. yeah. I mean, mum is... Unfortunately, yeah, in our latest launch, she wasn't, mm. you know, because we, we've had, a, I guess, some pretty good media around it. Yeah. Um, and, but she always said to me, you know, babe, is, she always said to me, even before I started making my first game, you'll do it. I think she was a massive supporter of me. She was uh, always out there, oh, Maru this and Maru that, and Maru's doing this game, and you know, and, and all that. So she believed I could do it, which I think helped me in my self-belief. You know, if mum thinks I can, then I can. Yeah. <laughs> but no, she she was my, um, she was the person I'd go to for all my advice, basically, around the story. And I mean, she, she used to tell me that, look, babe, you're not going to please everybody. She goes, but, you know, you, you do the best that you can. Um, tell the story, tell your story, um, and talk to your uncles and your aunties who are more knowledgeable in certain areas of what you're trying to do. And um, and look at your own whakapapa, is what she used to tell me. Just look who you are, where you're from, look towards your, your whakapapa for um, strength and for courage and direction. Yeah. What do you reckon she'd be saying now if she was still... Oh, she'd probably be like, car pie, babe. That was, <laughs> that was her favourite thing to say to me. Better than being a volunteer at the Salvation Army. <laughs> there we go, there we go. I said, yep, yeah, mum, you knew I was going to do this, and there we go. But yeah, she should be giving me the big car pie, babe. That was her, that's always what she would say, or text me. Hmm. She'd be like, oh, I heard your interview on such and such, car pie, babe. <laughs> hey, um, the world has changed a lot since you started your company. Um, gamification has 
literally changed the game for so many aspects. It's the biggest sports entertainment industry now, bigger than wrestling, bigger than sports games themselves. And you've probably been to a couple of those world tournaments with, mm. you know, Fortnite and the like. They just get hundreds of thousands of people in a massive stadium and, and then the millions watching around the world. That also presents opportunities but challenges, yeah. right? Where, how do you keep your unique identity market in, the, in that massive marketplace now? Well, it is a massive marketplace. I mean, and it's pretty saturated. And it's a hard marketplace as well. On one side, it's harder. On one side, it's easier. Mm. So back in 2004 or five, making games was extremely expensive. You only had three platforms that you could deliver to, really, which was Xbox, Nintendo, and PlayStation. That's right. Um, and there was Nokia. They had snakes on the phone, you know. And, but mobile gaming wasn't around back then. Um, and and now it is. It's opened up the market. Uh, you can develop an app or a game, uh, you know, for twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. Now the problem that we have now as developers is marketing, mm. because now we have to sort of target the market and spend a bunch of money on sort of letting people know that our games are out there. So on one side, it's got easier, but on the other side, there's a new learning curve. You know, publishers used to take care of getting your game out there and around the world and in front of everybody. Um, but in saying that, the, the opportunity, especially for us in New Zealand, especially for Māori, is that we have unique stories to tell. And are those unique stories, uh, not just for Māori, but also Indigenous communities, right? Are they... Um, approachable, accessible, are, are they? Are people wanting to hear those unique stories? Because we hear yeah. about this in film and TV, right? Is it the same in gamification? Are people wanting to hear, see, play yeah. in that space with our indigenous mm. heritage, culture, narrative? They are now. Mm. I mean, before? Mm. Well, yes, we've heard of that movie, you know, and it was a great movie and all that and, and la la la, but now it's, uh, yeah. There is demand for it, and it's showing through through bigger game publishers who are starting to put through Māori or Indigenous cultures into their mainstream games, and it's like, wow, okay, so there is a, um, an appetite for Indigenous storytelling out there, uh, and the problem is, is that if we don't do it ourselves, you know, as Indigenous, as Māori, then they're going to do it for us. Mm. So who better to tell our stories than us? You know, whether it's fictional like Guardian Maya or whether it's based on your hapu um, story about somebody, it's unique content. And I guess that's the one of the problems out there now with all types of media is looking for unique content. You know, what's going to be the next big thing we can sort of do? And um, and that's why we and that's what we see in games now. I see this new character released, and he's got a pew pew on and a and a muck on a, on his face, and it's like, but he doesn't have a Maori name, mm. but they call him a Maori character, and it's like, oh, oh that would have been really cool if they'd given that character a fucker papa, mm. you know, and who is he and where is he from? Because that's how we do with all our games. We give a fucker papa to everything. You know, like Guardian Maya, who was she? Um, where is she from? So got that sorted. You know, um, because it helps with the uniqueness of the storytelling because that's what we do is in our culture. We know our whakapapa, we know where we're from and we have stories to tell. So I think that content or that want for content, for indigenous content will just get stronger and stronger. And if we're not looking at um, ways to get our content out there or different ways then like what I said before someone else will yeah okay so what's your final message then for those who are currently thinking about being in this space already in this space not just Māori mm -hmm. and indigenous content developers uh, indigenous gaming companies um, mm. because again you know the title of this podcast is Indigenous 100 and we do think there are some lessons from Māori leaders like yourself um, that can help not just give lessons and uh, I 
guess a pr provide a trajectory and a plan forward for them, but also those currently. What would be your message to them? Because I feel like one of the th really important things is collectively we can actually access markets, tell our stories in a much more yeah. authentic, unique way, therefore protecting our kind of culture and identity. If we do that together, it's much more robust as opposed to doing it separately, right? So mm. what would be your kind of main message to those who watch this, who are thinking either in the space, already in the space, or may already be in the space? What do you say to them? Kia kaha. <laughs> Take those steps forward. I mean, it is, a little bit easier these days than it was back when I was doing <coughs> my, um, I guess, finding my path and my journey. It's a, it's a bit easier now. But just knowing that our content is special, I mean, it really is because we make it special and no one can tell it like how we can. For someone else to tell it, they have to, or they should consult with you. But why consult with you when you can just tell it yourself um, and have the confidence to bring those stories to life. I mean, there is concern around IP protection and unfortunately with games, you, there's a lot that can't be copyrighted or trademarked or anything like that. And if you want to go down the sort of patent track, then it has to be a particular technology within the gaming right. engine or, or something that you're doing that's quite unique. But in terms of content, it is very difficult to protect that. So the best form of protection is to tell the story yourself, um, to have that support with community. You know, it's almost like an indigenous brand would be the best form of protection. It's like, whoa, okay, this is an indigenous story told by indigenous people that makes it unique content. It could also make it premium content. Um, and, you know, if you look in terms of commercialization or anything like that. But the more that's out there, it, it's funny in a way, because the more that's out there, it seems that the more it would be protected, even though it most likely would be ripped off totally. But if there's that branding awareness around Indigenous content and that, then it will be seen as premium. You know, it's, it's yeah, having a strong supportive community to be able to highlight each other's mahi and work and what we do and tell those stories that ultimately will protect them in some form or another because others just might be seen as rip-offs mm. <laughs> i don't know you mm. know it, it could be like that so it is a lot of getting in and um getting it out there yeah, yeah. and by us as consumers Mm. Playing your games. There we go. There yeah, we go. supporting our content. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Hidai no rui apanami, play her games. <laughs> <laughs> my daughters. Hey, um, I've got to say, um, not bad for a girl who grew up at Tuahiwi. Yeah. Playing in the ditches. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Um, yeah. I think, you know, there's a lot that people can learn from the journey that you've taken mm. that can be inspired by you. Um, and I think can certainly support them and what they're doing, whether it be in gamification or other parts, particularly being an entrepreneur, being a business leader, recognised by the Māori Business Awards. I think there's a lot that they can draw from you. Thank you for giving them the advice. Thank you. Thank you for having me here, talking with you. I've enjoyed the conversation. Kāpā. Yeah. Good night. Well.